what do the numbers tell us? How many people are infected with COVID-19? What is the death rate among those who have fallen ill? The answers to those questions have influenced policy decisions like whether to impose lockdowns, enforce mask wearing, or encourage people to work from home. But often the official figures fall short of reflecting the reality on the ground, and the stakes of getting it wrong could hardly be higher. Welcome to our COVID-19 special. I'm Monica Jones and like many of you, I've been staring at daily statistics for the last 18 months. How many new infections are there in my neighborhood, my hometown, my country? And what's the situation like elsewhere, for example, where I have friends and family? But what do those numbers and curves actually mean? And can they be trusted? In India, the scale of suffering caused by the coronavirus defies comprehension. Official figures put the number of deaths at 423,000. But experts believe that may be a vast undercount. The real figure, according to a report by the Center for Global Development, could be 10 times that. It's thought that poor healthcare infrastructure in rural areas, as well as lack of access to testing, may have led to the dramatic underreporting of coronavirus cases in the country. One method researchers use to determine whether COVID-19 deaths are being accurately counted is to compare the figures to the rate of excess deaths over a given period. Take Russia, for example. Between the beginning of April and the end of June of this year, the country recorded well over half a million more deaths than usual. Just over a quarter of them were attributed to COVID-19. While there could be other reasons to account for the excess deaths, it's one indicator that coronavirus cases may be going underreported. Despite that, Moscow authorities have recently been easing restrictions with people no longer obliged to show proof that they've been vaccinated or have immunity in order to sit in indoor venues. But not everyone trusts the official data. The spread of the infection has decreased. There are fewer sick people now, Moscow Mayor Sergei Sobyanin says. I think this data is partially faked. It's done so that we'll feel safe. Why fake it? They're looking at Europe in particular. If their infection numbers go down, ours should show that too. Interpreting official figures isn't straightforward. Whether or not the data is catching asymptomatic cases can have a big impact on death rates, for example. So can other factors, like whether the infection is mainly spreading among the young or old. As well as accuracy, there is the more fundamental issue of transparency. So far, North Korea has told the World Health Organization that it has not detected a single case of COVID-19 in the country. International observers have cast doubt on that claim, with some reports suggesting that quarantined North Koreans are being treated like pariahs. An extreme example, perhaps, of a wider truth. The less data available, the more dangerous the virus. Well, for more, I'm joined by Andreas Backhaus. He's a research fellow at the Federal Institute for Population Research. So very good to have you with us. Uh, and I believe as early as February, you already suspected the low death count in India is due to massive undercounting. How did you come to this conclusion? On what evidence did you base it? Thank you for having me, Monica. Um, Actually, it was quite easy to come up with this um, theory, I would call it by then, because we already had zero prevalence surveys from India who were estimating the number of truly infected among the Indian population. And even before the large wave of Delta um, happened in India, we already knew there had been maybe up to 284 million cases in India, which meant the official case count was undercounting by a factor of 28. And just from there, it made very much sense to conclude probably the death, the COVID-19 death must also be heavily undercounted then. Mm. Because if your testing capacities are so constrained, 
you will not have the tests to run them on the deceased people. Right, so the numbers just didn't match. Uh, but statistics about new infections or the numbers of deaths, uh, they are supposed to help decision makers assess the situation and come up with adequate measures. That, of course, is hard when the data isn't reliable. How can this problem be solved? Well, let me look at the bright side first. Of course, the COVID-19 pandemic is already the best documented pandemic in human history by far, because day by day, uh, we can publicly trace the evolution of the pandemic uh, basically in real time, and every day we are adding new knowledge about the pandemic. Um, that said, the data cannot answer all of our questions, either because it's not providing the right information we need at this point in time, or because our analysis aren't conclusive, which really isn't a bad thing. Working in research, data not being conclusive or being kind of messy, that's just a totally normal workday of... Um, <laughs> researchers <laughs> yeah um, but it, it requires a certain the, it requires a certain data literacy uh, from policymakers uh, because to them it it has to be conclusive else they can't act well I would say it requires data literacy among the people who are informing the policymakers which are fortunately often skilled researchers and the main advantage that we have in science as researchers is that what we are doing is really mostly about figuring out which data we can trust, which analysis is conclusive and which is not. Mm. And we achieve this by submitting our analysis to our peers, who will then subject it to a very tough review and challenge our interpretations. That happens all the time. It's not always pleasant, I can tell you. You cannot always come up with a fully convincing response, but that's how it works. And right. The analysis not always being fully conclusive on every question, that's just the norm. Right. But of course, there are different approaches and uh, different approaches also in different countries. Uh, and even correct or similar approach of data uh, can lead to confusion. For example, there are, I believe, uh, different concepts used to measure mortality from SARS-CoV-2. There is the case fatality rate, the infection fatality rate and the mortality rate. How should those terms be used so they make sense in a statistic? Indeed, these are the most uh, mixed up terms in the whole pandemic, probably. So the case fatality rate, <clears throat> that's basically what we started out with in March 2020. Um, it's just you take the number of COVID-19 deaths and you divide it by the number of COVID-19 cases. Right, so the case fatality rate is the easiest one to compute, but it's also the most biased one by the testing regimes in different countries and at different points in time. The infection fatality rate tries to um, give a real estimate of the danger of dying from COVID-19 by taking all infections into account, those that have been detected as cases and those that have gone undetected, for which we do these large seroprevalence infection surveys, like in the UK. Finally, the mortality rate, that's really more of a demographic term. That's just um, the total number of people who've died from a disease relative to the total population. That is really more retrospective um, perspective on the disease. All right. Well, then, uh, Andreas Backhaus from the Federal Institute for Population Research, uh, thank you so much for your time and for sharing your insights with us. Thank you, Monica. Now, the pandemic seems to have split society into two groups, those who seek answers from experts and those who reject data they don't understand. And where does this leave science as a whole? Time to ask Derek. What impact has the pandemic had on the public perception of science? One of the things the pandemic has done is radically change the way that many of you out there in the public view science and scientists. Uh, some have turned into really famous figures who are now uh, really well known, not just in their home countries, but, but all over the world. Uh, Germany also, of course, gained a few new science celebrities in, in 2020. Uh, the most prominent of them, uh, virologist-in-chief Christian Drosten. Um, millions of Germans tune in for his regular pandemic podcasts. Uh, he's even been turned into a traditional Christmas ornament. Um, so one way COVID-19 has certainly changed public perception of science 
is by dragging researchers and science experts out of the shadows they, they mostly worked in up until now and thrusting them and their fields uh, onto center stage. I mean, I'm sure there are lots of kids here in Germany now saying, I want to grow up to be the next Christian Drosten. And, and if you ask me, that's a great thing. And I'd like to make another point about public perception and, and science. Um, in a series I've been watching recently, a, a passionate researcher at one point bursts out and says, science improves lives and, and shines light on the glorious world around us. Um, it's a beautiful way of saying something that, that I, I personally have always believed. But the astounding thing is how many other people now seem to have been convinced of it too. Um, back in pre-pandemic days, I used to regularly bore people at dinner parties with my excited monologues about new research. Um, now, I regularly have lively discussions on COVID science with everyone from the kids in my street uh, to my mother-in-law about everything from, from aerosol behavior to, to the speed of mutation in viruses. Um, so, so this year, I think, has driven a lot of people who used to be bored with or, or afraid of scientific topics to engage with them in, in amazing ways. And, and I'm hopeful that that interest will remain uh, long after the pandemic is brought under control. Thanks for watching.